Episode number 261, Helping Your Church Live Stream with Paul Richards. Let's do it. This is the definitive podcast for helping you plan, create, and execute dynamic worship experiences at your church. Useful, practical content in the areas of production, worship, communications, first impressions, and more. This is Making Sunday Happen. Hey guys, welcome to Making Sunday Happen. I'm Carl. Thanks so much for being here. This week's episode of the podcast is sponsored by SALT Conference. SALT is the creative conference for the church. The event has moved to a virtual experience, and it's going to be really, really good. So be sure to grab tickets at saltnashville.com, saltnashville.com. This week on the podcast, I welcome Paul Richards. Paul hosted the Worship Summit Live Conference in July, great online event for worship leaders and church media folks. Paul is the chief streaming officer at the Stream Geeks, which is an online platform that helps churches and other clients with live streaming and digital experiences. Today, we're going to be walking through Paul's book, Helping Your Church Live Stream. Uh, We're going to hit on why churches should adopt live streaming technology if you haven't, uh, how to get started if you haven't, uh, but mostly how to move from one-way communication that live streaming provides to two-way communication using uh, tools like Zoom and, and other things. So we'll take a deep dive into how to use Zoom breakout rooms to engage your congregation. We're going to talk through OBS and selecting the right gear for your church and more. Jam-packed episode of the show this week. So we'll get right into my conversation with Paul right after this. Check this out. Hey, 1230 Media community. It's Luke McRoy from SALT Conference. We just announced that this year we're going virtual for the first time ever. So SALT 2020 will be an online experience that anyone can tap into from anywhere in the world. You can register and get your ticket at saltnashville.com. But don't worry, there'll still be all the great speakers like Andy Minio, Nikki Lerner, Joseph Sojourner, Glenn Packiam, Brady Schreer, Stephen Brewster, and countless others. Take a look at all the details, and we'll see you this October at saltnashville.com. Hey guys, today I welcome Paul William Richards. Paul is the Chief Streaming Officer at the Stream Geeks and the author of Live Streaming is Smart Marketing, among other books. Paul teaches over 20,000 students taking courses on live video production, mobile streaming, and more. Paul, welcome to the podcast, man. Thanks for hanging out. I'm super happy to be here, Carl. Thanks for having me. Now, tell me a little bit about your role at Stream Geeks. Uh, I was watching some stuff online, man. You guys are doing some fantastic work, um, uh, especially in in the church space and in other spaces. Uh, tell me how uh, who you serve and, and what you guys do over at Stream Geeks. Sure. So we're located in Westchester, Pennsylvania, and myself and a small team uh, come together and we really try to help translate how a lot of the great technology that's available today can apply to specific uh, organizations, churches, and houses of worship being one that we mainly focus on. And so that involves, you know, taking the tech and making, simplifying it and trying to figure out what actually works. And, um, you know, we create courses and I, I wrote a book called Helping Your Church Livestream in 2019. It's been really popular and really just trying to detail everything out create free online courses and tutorials so that folks can, you know, really apply some of this powerful technology that might seem a little difficult to understand uh, without a guide. And I was reading your book uh, this week and uh, you, you really do a great job of bringing it down to my level. So both beginner, inter- intermediate and advanced people, I think it's great information for wherever you are in that spectrum. Um, And I was reading, did you update it for the pandemic? Uh, Do you have an updated version or um, how how has that worked? Yeah, so luckily it is self-published. So I can push updates uh, anytime I'd like. I don't need to, you know, call a publisher to do so. So um, I did a whole big update on kind of a little bit of an epiphany that I had. You know, this, this book is called Helping Your Church Livestream. And, you know, in 2019, that was really important. It was helping churches kind of provide 
folks with a window inside of their church so that they would one day walk through the doors of that church and say, I kind of have already been here. I kind of already saw it on Facebook. I, I see there's space for me and I want to bring my family into the church. And when the pandemic hit, you know, I, I've been obviously talking and working with a lot of churches. And what we realized is that right now, churches really need to go beyond live streaming and start thinking about two-way communications using yeah. Zoom and other communications. And so we kind of rewrote the book there, not just for, uh, well, I added a chapter, uh, but it really was thinking about, okay, here's where we are at COVID, where it's 100% distributed right? Like everyone's at home and no one's going into the church. But what happens when people start to come back to church? It's not everybody, you know, it's just socially distanced. Maybe it's just the younger folks. Uh, it's, you know, everyone's wearing masks to and from the car and to church. And what happens during that time? And how can we still include folks who have to join via Zoom maybe from a senior living center, maybe because they have underlying health conditions. So it actually covers how to transition from live streaming to two-way communication. And then how do you include that two-way communication in the church service so that the pastor can answer questions from folks who are never going to, unfortunately, ever be able to come back to church? Because it it's, it's a reality at this point. So I want to get into all that. So one, one thing that I've been pushing is on, that online's not going anywhere. If you were not online before the pandemic, and, and now you are, you're not going to go back and turn your and, and not do your stream. I mean, that's just don't do that. Like, uh, you got to have a, a, either an 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 online only presence or an online and in person presence. That's kind of my view. So I'd love I'd love to get your thoughts on that. And also, uh, one thing that you have mentioned. Uh, w- when we've talked before is that maybe, maybe it's more than just a camera in the back of the room, M- you know, recording and distributing what is happening in the room. There maybe needs to be more intentionality put into the online experience, whether that's through Zoom, whether that's through online host, whether that's crafting the experience for both audiences. Give me kind of a, an overview of what you think about the shift. Yes. Well, um, one of the uh, biggest issues right now is that the shift is, is like you said, it, it's not just let's take our, our traditional services and just keep doing them, but add a camera in the back of the church. That just doesn't seem to work. And unfortunately, the statistics right now are, are really tough. Um, just to give you a high level of what Bill, uh, Bill Tenney Britton said at the Worship Summit yesterday is that 17% of all Americans are in the, the none category, meaning that they do not, you know, there's no affiliation to any, any worship um, or any congregation or denomination. And that's risen to 37% of millennials at this point. So the, the church has been kind of in a decline state for a, for a while now. And the issue is, is that live church attendance, meaning people actually watching the live stream, it's really it seems to be there was a leadership network posted. It's only like 30 to 40% of congregants are actually tuning into the live streams. And to top it off, uh, most people are only really willing to watch about 30 minutes. So I don't, you know, as a church uh, service provider, uh, if you're looking at the analytics and you look at maybe you reached a thousand people, it's interesting to look at how long did those people watch? What's the average watch time? Because there's so many easy ways to kind of click away. And so it really does become a, a thinking of how do we retranslate our message and package it into a way that fits into the, you know, folks' modern lives, uh, because we don't have a captive audience. They're not in the church. You know, they're not making that dedicated time, taking the entire family into church. They're at home. And there are some great strategies we can talk about, about, you know, asking, you know, your congregation to, to prepare for Sunday and take a shower and still get dressed up and get the family ready. And I've seen a lot of great work there, but the statistics out there are saying that, you know, people aren't going to watch more than a half hour. So can you do an interesting half hour where it's super engaging and then invite them to a Zoom session where they can see everybody face to face. And uh, so to answer your question, there is some interesting things that you can do. If you think about this, Carl, at a church service, when you sit down in the pews, you see the back of everybody's heads. Now you get to see your pastor, which is great in the front. 
But when you're on a Zoom session, you actually get to see the front of everyone's face. So you can look at 50 people face to face on a Zoom call. So there is some silver lining and there, is, there are ways to engage for more than 30 minutes. And that's going to be the key because we want to get back into people's lives and we want to get their attention. So let's start getting into uh, one-way communication, which is live streaming. It, it goes one way from your camera to the, uh, the stream. Uh, so let's get into the two-way communication. You mentioned Zoom. So get us into the practicality of that. How, how, do you, how would you bridge the gap between the in-person worship experience and maybe remote participants via Zoom or something like that? Let's, let's start getting into what it, what it looks like. Yeah. So again, to set the stage, you know, we're going from pre-COVID, which is everyone's face-to-face, everyone's in the same building, to COVID where everyone is distributed, to hopefully soon post-COVID where we've got this mix, right? And there's going to be no going back. We're going to definitely continue to have people joining via Zoom and via live streams, and it's not going to go away. In fact, uh, a funny story from Michael Begaman from Austin, Texas, his church. I did some really great research with him. And he said that once they started live streaming and doing these Zoom calls, they found out that their community was actually a lot larger and more far-flung than they originally realized. And people were joining spiritual sharing sessions from all over the world. So it's, it, there, are, there are some interesting um, s- s- situations and, and examples that I can share where churches are, are using social media and using like Zoom as a two-way communication platform and finding out, wow, there's somebody who moved away from Texas and now they're in Australia but they're making the time to join these spiritual sharing sessions because it was their hometown. So it really does broaden your reach in many ways. But to get to your question, um, Zoom is obviously becoming the super popular tool for online communications. For 20 bucks a month, you can have meetings of up to 300 people. That covers like 95% of churches. And it also includes the ability to have up to 50 breakout rooms. So you can break 300 people up into 50 small groups of six. And um, I want to make sure I'm hitting your question right, Carl, so I'm not going off on a tangent, but I have some really great ideas on how to use those breakout rooms to get super effective on giving people like small group personalized experiences. Um, And then the other thing is the live streaming side of it, the one way side of it, you know, live streaming on social media gives you this like maximized exposure on Facebook and YouTube, and it it really does work if you're consistent and you're engaging and interactive and you're actually taking prayer requests and listening to people and saying people's names out loud. Um, So hopefully in this conversation, at some point we'll talk about using live streaming, but also having people in Zoom. And I know that from a pastor's perspective, it can be difficult to preach or do a sermon to an empty room um, but what we're seeing churches do is put a television up and show 50 people's faces on a Zoom um, meeting it, on a television so that they have a confidence monitor so that they can see that there are real people connecting live in person and then actually speaking to those people and getting them to interact. So give me the service flow. Are you saying that uh, worship and then the pastor's message uh, it uh, is all one way and then you do a zoom call or are you saying that during the message people are engaging in a, in a zoom call there or both walk me through a service flow. Sure. Now, um, first of all, I think that we should start with uh, a high level of what, are, who are the people that are actually involved in, in putting a digital service together? Okay. So obviously there's the minister, right? Uh, the, the pastor. And that person is still to this day, he's the leader and he has a message. He or she has a message that, 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 they need, that they want to deliver and hopefully it's timely. Now, I do think we should encourage that person to be a little bit more than just a one-way broadcaster, right? Or a one-way deliver a message. Now, that is effective when you have warm bodies in a building and they can clap and they can respond and you can see them and you can, you can point to them and they, we can pray together in, in, a, in a church itself. That's effective to just have a half hour presentation where there's a lot of interactivity and standing and moving. But when there's nobody in there, we need to rely on digital tools, meaning we need to rely on a second person that can help that minister, which is what I could call a Zoom moderator. 
And that Zoom moderator can also help with moderating Facebook and YouTube, for example. So, the, so pastors need help. And so there's, there's like four people that are really key to putting on a online worship. So there's the minister, the pastor. There's generally an audio person. Okay. And most churches already have that. They've got an audio system. They have an audio person. And then generally nowadays there's a video person as well. And that's usually, you know, a stretch. Sometimes the audio person can also be the video person. A lot of churches don't have a dedicated video person yet. Uh, It could just be somebody who goes and starts a live stream, goes and starts the uh, Zoom meeting. And then the Zoom moderator that can be anybody in the entire world. They could, be, they could be in Japan. They could be in Hawaii. The Zoom moderator manages the Zoom meeting so that if somebody wants to raise their hand and speak to the minister or the pastor, they can unmute and mute them. So there's some Zoom moderation technical skills that are required uh, to do this all properly so that you don't have a whole bunch of people who are unmuted and then the pastor's hearing somebody eat lunch or somebody drive down the road, somebody's kind of kind of got to moderate all of that. So those are the four people. And between those four people, ideally you've got, let's say you've got an audio system, you've got a camera. Essentially in a perfect world, the pastor comes on, he has a very engaging presentation that's very timely. He's got a message to deliver. And then as soon as that message is, is over and it's short and it's sweet, he gets right into engaging everyone and entering into almost a virtual world where he's saying, hi, everybody. Now that, now that we've talked about that, let's jump into an exercise. So it's more than just a presentation. It's an interactive exercise. So how can we apply the message that the pastor has just given us in an exercise where now it's a two-way communication, where now we're asking people questions. They're asking the pastor questions. The pastor's asking them questions. And then ideally there's breakout rooms. So it's like, let's take these 300 people. Let's mix them up randomly. So they get to know other people in their congregation. People really crave that communication capabilities in the small groups um, and then go from there. So hopefully that makes sense. So there's, yeah. I was just trying to lay down that the people required, a pastor cannot do this themselves. They're going to need some help. So let's get into breakout rooms. Give me how you have talked to churches about how to use breakout rooms and what you've seen be effective when using them. Yeah. So, so one of the things is breakout rooms is, uh, are incredibly easy to use. And that's the really awesome part. So the Zoom moderator, whoever is the host of the Zoom meeting, should enable breakout rooms in Zoom. They actually don't show up by default. You have to go into your Zoom system and enable them. And then you'll see these, this little breakout room button at the bottom control bar. And what you can do is you can click that button and it will either automatically or manually allow you to set up these breakout rooms. So you can name the breakout rooms. You know, one could be for Bible studies. One could be for nurseries. One could be for, um, you know, just for managers and you could do it that way. Or let's take the scenario of randomly mixing five to seven people. Now here's what I've seen work. Super small groups of like four to six, it can be a little dicey because if you don't get two or three talkative people, in that breakout room, then you might end up with like four or five people who are just shy and nobody says anything to anybody. Even if you just get one talkative person, who are they going to talk to? So what we've seen is a little bit larger groups, like seven to 10 people. That really um, you know, makes the chances of getting two or three talkative people in a group together, that'll be more productive. But the most important thing, so, with, so let's say we've got that. So you've got 300 people in your Zoom meeting. Let's say you have 100 people in your Zoom meeting. And let's say you're going to do 10 breakout rooms of 10. Um, that gives you a pretty good odds that you're going to get specific people in there. Now, if you have worship leaders on, in, your, in your church, and you know these worship leaders are going to really help engage and get the conversation going, you can create 10 breakout rooms with 10 people And then you can exchange, it's called, Zoom calls it exchanging people and make sure that you have like one worship leader in each of these groups of 10, if you have enough worship leaders to do that. So you can randomize everybody and then manually kind of move people around so you get the right people in each room. But from a high level, what you want to do is you want to set a good expectation of what's going to happen if you want this flow to work properly. 
So let's say in this new world where we're live streaming, and by the way, you can include Zoom into the live streams, which is really powerful, and we talk about that in the book. But essentially, um, in these breakout rooms, you want to say, all right, we're going to have a, 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 short, a short message. We're going to read from a specific chapter of the Bible, or we're going to have a, a message, you know, and then we're going to get into these exercises that's going to apply the message to your life, right? So we can go from content to context and really allow people to internalize the messages of Jesus or the messages specifically that you're talking about in your session. So we go from kind of a one-way message broadcast to a two-way interactive. And I like to challenge pastors to think about exercises that could only happen on Zoom or could only happen in small groups. So think about, like, for example, um, you know, you could do something along, there's a lot of great icebreaker exercises, um, but you can kind of plan questions for people to think about in small groups. Here's a, a great example. Sorry, Carl, that I'm kind of rambling. No, you're fine. But here's an example, one that I think would work really well. So you've got your, your message that, that you, you, you're talking about and you're broadcasting. And then when you get out into the breakout rooms, you prepare like two or three questions for people to consider in small groups. And then you bring the small groups back into the large group and you ask people to share their insights with the entire group. And that's a very simple strategy. So you're going from message to you know, really thinking about it in small groups and talking about it in small groups. And obviously, the benefit of small groups is that more people can say and hear more from because there's not this huge group, but then everybody comes back to the big group and shares their insights. So it's a very interesting process of meeting more people, seeing more people, getting more in-depth conversations. Um, so, and I have other, you know, other churches are using it for instead of like coffee hour that they used to have mm -hmm. after the service. Mm -hmm. Now they do these little breakouts. Uh, spiritual sharing sessions are great. Uh, but it's all about laying down expectations right up front so people can be excited, right? It's kind of like staging. You know, you should stage it as if, you know, those breakouts are the coolest, most engaging, awesome thing that they're going to look forward to. And I think that's really appropriate because it is engaging and it is exciting to meet new people in these small groups and talk about, you know, these amazing messages about Jesus and everything else that uh, pastors are teaching. Give me some examples of churches that you've worked with that have used this on, on a Sunday. Uh, is it mostly on Sunday or are they doing it uh, more? I mean, obviously we can use Zoom as, as a Bible study tool during the week, but um, I, I'm really after how, or how churches are using this on, on Sunday as their, their worship experience. So give me, give me some uh, examples of the churches that you've worked with that how their flow has gone on a Sunday. Yes, I think that's a great idea. And so, so Michael Begeman is, is one of the churches I've worked with the most. He, his church is the third force. It's in Austin, Texas. And uh, it's, oh, I'm sorry, that's not the, I'm blanking on the name of his church right now. Um, but let me just go through the, the workflow that, that we've been working on together. Um, so essentially, um, you know, these breakout rooms, are everyone's really looking forward to them. Now, one of the things a lot of people don't realize about Zoom is that Zoom has not just an in-meeting chat room, but also a persistent chat, an asynchronous chat that can be shared with your entire congregation. So I don't know if you know this, Carl, but in Zoom, in the Zoom client, and so if anyone who has Zoom on their phone or Zoom uh, on their computer, you can invite them to be a contact in Zoom, so that when you have your Sunday meetings, uh, it's, it's really effective. It's better than trying to, well, you can email everybody, of course, but it's persistent chat room, so you can have a chat channel. So what, what the church is doing is they have like 200 people in this chat channel, and they might have like three or four chat channels. So as you said, there might be a chat channel for Bible studies, there may be a chat channel for spiritual sharing, and it's almost like a Slack for churches where the pastor can jump right into uh, a, a individual one-on-one -on -one video call, or he can launch a call with everyone in that specific channel. So uh, what we're seeing is that the Zoom meeting itself becomes um, the main place to go. And then uh, the church actually captures that Zoom meeting and live streams it. 
Okay, so there's still a stream on Facebook. There's still a stream on YouTube. In fact, on the stream on YouTube and Facebook, they're actually saying, hey guys, you know, we're live right now. You can actually join the Zoom meeting. You can get off of this one-way stream to Facebook and YouTube and join us and talk to us and be part of this collaborative breakout session that's about to happen. So his church kind of leads up to these breakout rooms where, you know, the pastor is speaking to, unfortunately, an empty room, right? And he's looking at a camera that's almost 100 feet away from him. But they put a television up really close to him so he can see everyone's faces that he's preaching to. And it really helps him kind of, you know, I've also seen other, other churches actually put cardboard people in the stands. They're actually doing that in Major League Baseball right now. But so you can actually see them. And then there's a Zoom moderator who literally speaks directly to the pastor. The pastor has a little in-ear monitor so he can actually hear everyone in the Zoom call. And the Zoom moderator will essentially mute everybody, okay? So as the pastor is giving his service and he is you know, chatting and giving, giving the message of the day, uh, it's just him kind of talking to everybody. But then the moderator asks people to use the raise hand feature and so they'll raise their hand and the pastor can see a little list of all the people who have raised their hands and he'll call out people's names. And it's so important to do that. Even if you're just one way broadcasting to say people's names, it will engage them and capture their attention and it makes them feel recognized. So as a, if you're a pastor out there and you're either using Zoom or just Facebook or YouTube live streaming, you know, consider engaging those folks who are watching. And so he's engaging everyone and saying, hi, thank you for being here, Tom, Sally, Anna, everyone who's there. And then when it comes time to the, the two-way Q&A portion, the Zoom moderator will share the list of people who have their hands raised. He, they will unmute them so the pastor can hear their questions and respond and then continue to respond. And then finally, he'll say, all right, well, now it's time to, to uh, go out into our breakout rooms. The exercise of the day today We'll be sharing this question and we're going to talk about them. Please take, you know, and setting really good expectations. Please take 20 minutes to meet someone new, exper uh, share an experience about this topic with them, and then come back to the group and let's all share what we've learned together. So that's kind of the workflow that we're seeing uh, become really engaging. Cool. Um, tell me some of the, uh, so let's get into the technical a little bit. So can you give me some steps to building my church streaming system. So like, how do I leverage my existing equipment in the church and some other things like that? Like how do I set up uh, my, my system in order to stream? Sure. So, um, so churches are, are, are fairly big spaces. Uh, and, you know, not everybody has the budget to turn their church into a video production studio. Right. Um, but it is nice to have a camera with optical zoom. Because, because churches are so large, a webcam is just not going to do it in most cases. You can put a webcam in there and you can see the whole church and that's great. And maybe you can use that um, as, a, as one of your views. But it's nice to have a camera that can zoom in and really show the pastor up front. So that's kind of one of the first things people do. Uh, obviously, with the audio mixer, um, it's actually really easy to use that audio mixer with your live stream. So the audio mixer generally has an audio output. So the newer ones have a USB output, which is great because you can just plug that right into your computer, combine it with a webcam or a PTZ camera that can zoom in, and you've got a pretty decent audio and video scenario. So your audio system, which is the expensive and hard part to really set up, is done. And you just got to plug that into your computer, either with you know, an analog audio output, which can plug into the 3.5 millimeter adapter, on or input into your computer. And I can talk about those in more depth if you'd like. Some of the newer computers only have USB. So you can get a USB to 3.5 millimeter adapter to plug that audio board into your computer. And uh, PTZ Optics cameras, the USB models, they have a 3.5 millimeter input. So you can plug it right into the camera, uh, which is really nice because sometimes there's audio and video sync issues with uh, syncing up an audio board with various cameras. Uh, and plug the USB from the PTZ Optics USB camera right into your computer with audio and video. But essentially, your audio board is very easy to adapt to a live streaming software right on your computer. OBS is totally free. That's probably the most popular 
streaming software in the church. And then you could use a webcam, but upgrading to a camera with optical zoom, and then maybe having two cameras uh, along with a second monitor that could show the PowerPoint or lyrics is really a great place to start. Tell me about, let's talk about OBS for a minute. Um, tell me how I can use OBS and make it look a little bit more like a pro switcher. You know, I'm a huge fan of OBS. It can do so much and it's totally free. So I actually uh, wrote a book called The Unofficial Guide to Open Broadcaster Software, which you guys can get totally for free online if you Google it. And uh, it goes through all the things that you can do with OBS. OBS is incredibly powerful. It's essentially set up like this. There's scenes and there's sources. Okay, so scenes are collections of sources. So sources could be obviously your audio mixer. That would probably be on all the scenes. Uh, It could be a logo of your church. It could be a webcam source. It could be a camera source. If you have a camcorder, maybe you take the HDMI from a camcorder and use something called a capture card to turn the HDMI into USB, and maybe that's a source. But the cool thing is that you can get really creative with these um, scenes. So you could have one scene that just shows a a video and maybe that's a a 30 second video clip. Maybe it's a 30 minute video clip. Uh, Ideally, we want to design something that's highly engaging. So it's nice to have maybe two or three minute video clip right when you start live streaming, recording, or uh, including a Zoom session in there. Uh, Maybe that's a scene. Maybe scene number two is your pastor full screen. Maybe scene number three is your pastor and the Zoom meeting. And that's what I am very uh, big proponent of. I've done some tutorial videos on this on YouTube, but combining in this digital age, maybe not forever, but maybe forever because you do want to accommodate all people in the world who want to attend your service, is a kind of a split screen. So you have the camera of your pastor and a screen capture, which is another source, which would be essentially just capturing a secondary screen on your computer of the Zoom meeting. So you can show your pastor next to all the people who are worshiping together. So there's, it, it's really unlimited the way that you can mix and match these scenes and sources. Obviously, OBS can be used to live stream all of that and record all of that. And here's the kicker, Carl. There's a plugin called Virtual Cam that will take everything in OBS and output it directly to Zoom. So we're actually on Zoom right now. I can show you an example of that. But for the podcast, for those listeners, the, ID, the nice part there is that now everyone on the Zoom call can see everything that people are seeing on Facebook and YouTube in the live stream. So it's really a nice way to kind of mix the worlds of the live broadcast on social media and the two-way communications that we keep talking about being so important um, online. Give me some tips on selecting uh, switchers, cameras uh, for my live stream. Do you have any camera and switcher tips? Well, you know, again, I'm a huge uh, proponent of OBS, right? So Mm -hmm. OBS is really a switcher in many ways. But the uh, issue is, is that you're leveraging your own computer. So the church is going to have to buy a laptop or a dedicated computer of some sort. Um, Now, a lot of churches right now already have a a computer that is being used to connect to maybe like a projector. Um, So they're showing something uh, up on the projector or the screen. So that computer... Uh, is possible that it could be used for OBS and showing um, things up on, on the projector. Or maybe that computer could just be u- being used for, for OBS right now because streaming and, and Zoom is so important. So that computer probably, and again, you know, hardware switchers are fine and there's a lot of great ones out there. Depends on how many cameras you need. Depends on whether you're going to use HDMI or SDI. Really quickly, HDMI generally is like limited on the cable lengths. SDI can go like hundreds of feet. So if you're a really big church and you want to put three or four cameras up there, you should probably go with SDI. HDMI um, is generally used for like shorter distances. And then again, I'm a big proponent of software. So like OBS is free. You can actually put something called a PCIe capture card into a computer and get four HDMI or four SDI inputs directly into your computer. And it's actually going to be cheaper than many hardware switchers. Um, and you could run OBS or vMix or Wirecast. So I'm a big software switcher guy because you're going to need a computer to run Zoom. You know? You're going to need a computer to check to see if your Facebook and YouTube streams are going. 
Um, the switcher side is nice, and there's black magic switchers and there's Roland switchers, but generally you still got to take that switcher and bring it in to your computer anyway uh, to encode and stream all that. We talked about this a little bit, but uh, kind of the team in place, but tell me volunteer strategies for my live stream. Do you have any volunteer tips? Definitely. Um, so volunteers are the absolutely, you know, the lifeblood of getting this all together of, of the church. And there are so many great people who want to volunteer their time. They want to be part of the church. They, they see other people volunteering and what they're getting out of it. And like someone's husband's volunteering, then the, the wife wants to volunteer, and then the kids start volunteering because they want to be part of this amazing community that, that, that you have. Um, the, the biggest and best thing, and Dave Dolphin talked about this at the worship summit yesterday. Dave Dolphin's the practical pastor. He's from Oklahoma city area. And he said the, the top thing is if you're trying to put together, let's say a streaming system and you want people to volunteer and you want them to be excellent, you want them to strive for excellence. You need to show that you are striving for excellence. So your workspace should be tidy right? And if you go into a kitchen and there's all stuff all over the floor and, um, you know, it's kind of dirty, you don't even want to make any food there. But if you go into a kitchen and it's pristine and clean and everything's labeled, you can walk right in and you can start making a sandwich. It's the same way with video production. You want to make sure everything is tidy, everything is labeled so that when, and really just to kind of show people that their job there is to strive for excellence. So, even if someone is just running Pro Presenter, right, where they click that space bar and it changes the slides, or they're clicking that button to advance the lyrics that are showing up right before the next, uh, you know, chord chart that's going on the live stream or the recorded video, you want them to make sure that they're, they feel like they're an important part of your team. So at one is to make sure your space is clean, everything about it, and that also includes asking for investment from the elders at your church. You know, if you're asking for a new computer or a new camera or an, a new microphone system and they come down and they sit with you and they look at your media space and it's a big mess, they're not going to know, well, you know, where is their system? Wh where is the funding going? So you want to make sure that everything is clean and labeled and, and attractive because I do think that with streaming and technology, it kind of just continues to build. You know, you have one microphone, then you have two microphones, then you have, you know, three stage inputs for three instruments, and then you have five because the band grows. And it's great because everything kind of grows because it's so important and it's such a, a key communication tool for the church. Um, but just make sure that you're growing on a strong foundation and you'll attract volunteers in that way and just make sure that they feel comfortable and confident um, and appreciated that they're, what they're doing is an important part of yeah. God's work. Good. Well, in our last few minutes together, I've got a couple of more uh, things I want to hit on. So let, let's talk about church copyright licensing. This is a, a big question that we get asked uh, a lot too. So how should I make sure that my church is covered when it comes to licensing? Well, uh, obviously a lot of people know about CCLI and CCLI is generally known about helping churches so that they don't need to worry about copyright infringement when they're pro projecting song lyrics on a projector or writing out chord charts uh, for popular songs uh, with their worship band, or even creating custom songbooks. Um, so CCLI, CCLI, Church Copyright License um, Organization, takes care of all of that. But what happens when we're streaming? Uh, well, they actually have a new streaming license that covers um, a lot of all of our favorite worship songs for your congregation to sing. Um, and it, it actually covers over 3,000 publishers. Um, and there's nearly 4, 450,000 songs, but it doesn't generally cover a lot of the secular songs. So you should reach out and obviously talk to CCLI, get the streaming and podcasting license uh, to cover most of the songs, but you should check Song Select, which is their tool to make sure that you are covered with the CCLI licensing um, because not every song is covered and uh, you can call them or check their website to make sure that you are covered for each song that you are. I'm using. Good. Tell me about YouTube and Facebook. Um, you know, of some, some algorithms that might be of benefit to know when it, when it comes to live streaming. So give me your YouTube, Facebook uh, tips. And also would you suggest a, like one thing that we've suggested is having a dedicated landing page on your website 
so that's kind of the main place that people go. Uh, also stream to Facebook, also uh, stream to YouTube, but that that landing page will keep your audience there a little bit longer so that they're not distracted by the cat video or the other post or something like that. So give me your opinion on that. Where should we be streaming and talk about some algorithms maybe? Well, I definitely think there's some uh, high level training uh, for your, your whole congregation on how to get connected to your live stream. Um, and, and I'm a big fan of YouTube. Most people have smart TVs now. So you want to make sure that they subscribe to your YouTube channel. So when you start streaming on Sunday, it'll pop actually right up and it'll be very easy for them to see right on the homepage. So for me personally, when I watch our church's live stream on Sunday, I, I literally just open up the YouTube app on the television itself. And it's like a three or four year old television, but it has the YouTube app and it actually has a Facebook app too. And you just go to it, boom, and it's on because you want to watch that kind of with your family. Yes, people watch it on their computers and on their smartphones. But I think when you get people to really watch an hour long service, it's on their home television with their family sitting on the couch. Yeah. So that is where like the YouTube app really plays. So yes, it's nice to have it on, on the church's um, computer uh, landing page and all of that. But I think the best place is to get them to sit down on the couch and watch it on the TV. And that means that they need to subscribe to the YouTube and the Facebook pages. And, e and now Facebook has an app. It's not as good as the YouTube app. The YouTube app is better. Um, I see Facebook as being a great way to spread the word, get your congregation to check in on Facebook, get them to share the live stream and your content. And then YouTube is probably a better place to get them to watch the whole service. And I, I see that everywhere. People watch longer on YouTube. Facebook, it's just designed to keep you, to keep scrolling every three seconds to switch to something else. It's like attention deficit disorder. It's just, mm -hmm. it's just you, Facebook's crazy. It's great and you should use it for what it does for you. I think YouTube works better for getting people to watch the whole service. Good, good, good. Uh, you mentioned uh, with, along the lines of Facebook, uh, you mentioned that in your book that the church check-in post is probably really undervalued and underused when it comes to, to churches. Explain that. So, and this was obviously a big deal when churches where everyone was in person. Uh, one of the great things about having a live stream is that it provides folks with a window into your church. And there's so many folks who are friends with somebody else who uh, might come to your church, but they're not quite sure if they want to yet. And if they see their friend just checking into church, um, it'll say, oh, look, here's my friend on Facebook. They are at church right now and they click to see where they are and they go, oh, look, it's a live stream. That's the, that's the service that they're in. Hey, look, there's my friend. You can see the back of their head, right? So it's an amazing experience to, to share via social media to say, oh, look, it, it's just so personal. And that's the way social media networks work, right? If you share a video or a live stream on your Facebook page, the only people that are going to see it are the people that like you or are connected, or sorry, like your page, not necessarily like you, uh, that, that are connected to you in your social media network. So that's the way it works. If you get other people to check in, now it's being shared with their social media network, and it kind of grows in that way. So especially if you're live streaming, it's very timely. You know, people can go look at your church page and then leave, but if they see that live stream, they might watch it for a little bit. So um, that is a great way to get more people to walk into the doors of your church. Now, right now, it's a little different. When they go see your live stream, I highly suggest, that's why we've talked about this as a theme, but think about this. You know, before, they would watch your live stream and go, that's a beautiful church. My friend is there. I want to go there next Sunday. But now, they can actually go, oh, look at that uh, church's live stream. Oh, look, there's a Zoom meeting happening right now. Oh, look, my friend is in the Zoom meeting. Oh, look, there's the Zoom meeting link. Let me join. I'm not going to join with my camera on. I'm not going to turn my microphone on. I'm not going to raise my hand and say something because I'm just getting used to this new church. But now they've taken a step from randomly looking for something on Facebook, seeing that they're friends at church, looking at your live stream and going, wow, there's a Zoom meeting? And then maybe after 30 minutes, they like the message. Now they're in a breakout session. Now they're meeting four or five people that they find out these are their neighbors. These are people who 
they're starting to get to know the people of the church. Because let's be honest, the church is a group of people and it's one by one, these relationships grow and change. So I think it's, that's why getting, coming full circle with you, Carl, right now where we're all distributed, that Zoom meeting is so important. And I think we can use the one-way broadcast on Facebook as an entry point to get into these Zoom meetings where we can get more engaged and interactive with people from around the world. Good. As we wrap today, last question for you. Do you, obviously, uh, we've talked about this a little bit, but do you think that online is here to stay? Uh, and how important is it for churches to learn and know how to live stream their services moving forward, even after COVID? Well, you know, we, we, we touched on some of the statistics. I mean, there's mainline decline in churches, yet a lot of evangelical churches are actually growing and, and planting churches and, 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 and having a huge movement. So, you, and that just goes to show that, you know, some of the more traditional dinosaur churches um, are just simply not adapting and they're declining in, in their relevance in modern age. So it's really, really important to, to, to stay relevant and communicate with people where they are. Unfortunately, you know, 37% of all millennials say that they, they have no affiliation with any denomination. And that's a number that has continued to grow. Uh, church attendance is down very much right now. So we really need to think about ways to go beyond just a one-way broadcast. It's you know, not interactive, not engaging, not enticing people, not capturing people's attention, and try to get into something that will provide immense value. Um, and it's very obvious once you see the difference between a live stream and a live stream with a live Zoom meeting, where people can come and say hi and meet people face-to-face and go into these breakout rooms. All you got to do is try it out, and you're immediately going to say, wow, this is a way to bridge the gap right now. And we're not going back to just never live streaming or doing these Zoom meetings again. This, uh, even when, you know, you know, even like, for example, like a lot of churches, they, they, they love and they have these people with, for, with them their whole lives. And then eventually they have to go live in a senior living center, right? When you start live streaming and you start hosting these Zoom meetings, you're going to reconnect with those people and realize that they, they literally, they're, they're, they shouldn't even be in church during flu season because it could be very dangerous to their health. Right, but using this tech technology, you'll find out that your congregation is much larger than you realized, more f- far flung, and even just basic live streaming. But I encourage everyone to do the Zoom meetings as well. Uh, is going to connect you with folks who couldn't ever make it into your church. So I don't think this is ever going to go away, and I think it's a great thing. Unfortunately, we're in very difficult times, and you know we 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 have to reinvent ourselves in order to, to remain relevant and share the message of God and become excellent. You know, striving for excellence is a very important part of, of, of worship and, and being part of the church. So this is part of that. I think we're striving for excellence here and um, striving to become a more relevant part of uh, the people's lives that we, we touch. Well, you guys are doing a great job at Stream Geeks, helping churches get up to speed and, and, and have their technology set. Um, and and learn to reach people in their community with with different forms of technology and different ideas. So, way to go! Uh, and tell tell us how we can keep up with you and and what you're doing. So you we live stream every Monday on the Stream Geeks channel. So streamgeeks.us and uh, connect with us on Facebook. Uh, feel free to download a copy of my book. The book comes with an online course. So it goes over all this stuff. As you mentioned, Carl, it has been updated for, to include a lot of this stuff. I know it's technical. That's why the book includes an online course. So it's totally free. The book's free. The course is free. We're just trying to help everybody kind of get up to speed. And then, of course, you can reach out to us. We like to get reached out to on Facebook. Um, so reach out to us there. We'd love yeah. to communicate with you guys. Awesome. Well, man, thank you so much for your time and really appreciate all you're doing and for sharing today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Carl. Appreciate it. Hey, guys. I've had the incredible privilege this year of speaking at several online events and conferences. And to be honest, I take a limited number of speaking gigs uh, each year to spend time at home with my family. But this year has provided a unique opportunity to say yes to more events. So uh, there are a few conferences that I'm speaking at coming up that I want to let you know about. Uh, That Church Conference, September 22nd through 25th, First Impressions Conference in November, 
and CFX, among others. But my talk at CFX will be on October the 27th. Uh, and I'll be sharing some ideas on how to double your volunteer team. So in this session, you'll learn how to pastor your volunteers first, how to focus on your why, uh, how to structure your team, how to provide a clear on-ramp for new volunteers, how to train your volunteers, and more. It's a full hour of practical strategies for creating a thriving, dynamic volunteer culture at your church. I would love for you to join me at CFX. Just visit churchfacilitiesexpo.com to learn more and to register. Again, that website is churchfacilitiesexpo.com. Churchfacilitiesexpo.com. Hey guys, it's Seth Muse, and I can't wait for you to check out next week's episode of the Making Sunday Happen podcast. I get to talk to Carl about how to make your worship service last all week long. We're going to talk about some tips and tricks and tactics for how you can slice up that content into smaller digestible parts that keep your people engaged online all week. It's going to be a really great episode. I hope you will listen. Hope you will watch it. Check out the next episode next week of the Making Sunday Happen podcast. Thanks. The show notes for this episode are available now at makingsundayhappen.com. Well, guys, be sure to check out our monthly roundtables hosted by Ben Stapley. These are real talk from the trenches of ministry. You can learn more at 1230.media forward slash roundtable. And the roundtables are exclusive to YouTube, our YouTube channel, and our app. So be sure to subscribe uh, or download the app on any device. This Friday, September 4th, all the roundtables release on the first Friday of every single month. These are monthly. Uh, This Friday, September 4th, Ben will welcome uh, a group of church, media, and production folks to the roundtable. So be sure to check that out. Uh, roundtable this month, all about church, media, and production, talking about what's going well uh, at your church, what uh, needs to be improved, learning from your mistakes, um, seeing what's uh, being effective uh, in the trenches of ministry. So roundtables hosted by Ben Stapley, first Friday of every month on YouTube and our app. All right, next week on the podcast, we will welcome my buddy, my pal, my amigo, someone who gets all of my 80s references. The great Seth Muse will be in the house. You're getting two weeks of Seth back-to-back musings, if you will. Next week, we'll be talking about how to make your worship experience last all week. And in two weeks, Seth and I will talk about the curse of success. So two really fun back-to-back episodes of the show with Seth Muse is coming up. Uh, If you haven't joined our Making Sunday Happen Facebook group, be sure to do so. Just search Making Sunday Happen on Facebook to join that group and get involved in the conversation. And be sure to rank and review our podcast in Apple Podcasts and wherever you consume your podcast. It really does help us get this content out to more and more churches and more and more people completely free. So thank you for doing that. We are the number one church media and production podcast in the country. So thank you for checking us out. Go out there and create some incredible worship experiences this weekend. I'll catch you next week. Making Sunday Happen is a production of the Ministry of 1230 Media. For show notes, archive episodes, and more free resources for your church, visit makingsundayhappen.com.